Great. Well, welcome back everybody from the break. Articles 108 and 109 of the UN Charter articulate the procedure for amending the Charter. And Article 109 specifically outlines a process for a Charter Review Conference, where the entire Charter can be revised and recast. Part three of that article states, and I quote, if such a conference has not been held before the 10th annual session of the General Assembly, following the coming into force of the present Charter, the proposal to call such a conference shall be placed on the agenda of, of that session of the General Assembly, end quote. Well, as it turns out, in 1955, the year in question, the proposal to call for a Charter Review Conference was on the agenda of the General Assembly, but that review never happened. Shari Arshari has done extensive research into why it never happened and has been building the legal foundation to make it happen and to transform the United Nations Charter into a world constitution. Shariar specializes in public international law and the UN Charter. He is the founding executive director and president of the Center for UN Constitutional Research in Brussels. And right now, he's just returned from COP26 in Glasgow. In addition to his PhD and LLM in international law, he holds a master's degree in computer science and a bachelor's in applied economics and management. Shariar has initiated several research seminars and programs, including a series on climate justice, democracy, and governance, and a series on how to assemble parliamentary assemblies. He also began an innovative program of youth climate activists, um, excuse, excuse me, youth climate ambassadors who are activists, bringing talented youth from every continent to network toward action and advocacy in building a sustainable planet. Shariar has presented worldwide at conferences and forums, mainly on climate justice and democracy, nuclear disarmament, and on the democratization and transformation of the United Nations through constitutional review, through, um, okay, yes, constitutional review and renewal. He's currently preparing for the publication of his research on the UN Charter Review process and its potential for letting we the peoples govern the world. His book entitled Reconstructing Article 109 Part 3 of the UN Charter as the Constitutionalization of the United Nations and International Law is due to be published next year. As with all of our speakers, Sharia will present for about 30 to 35 minutes and then we'll take questions. Donna will continue as timekeeper, and please place your questions in the chat window and direct them to me rather than to everyone so I can easily distinguish the questions from all of the background conversations. So in a moment, I'll also put the link to the Center for UN Constitutional Research in the chat window. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce Shariar Shari. Shariar? Thank you very much, Bob, and good evening, um, well, or good afternoon to you folks in the US. I'm here in Brussels. Um, uh, I just, uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Bob, and uh, some of my research actually has been inspired by some of you folks, the good folks at Citizens for Global Solutions. And for example, uh, the topics on Article 109, uh, I see Pat Daly is, uh, is one of the viewers, uh, was brought up by him in 1990s. Uh, prior to that, actually, World Federalist Movement in 1960s was uh, highly active in getting UN Charter reviewed. And in fact, they had a couple of presentations to the Congress in early 1960s, where until 1967, the US government actually was in favor of a charter review. That process uh, or that uh, inclination stopped during the Nixon administration and US joined uh, China, 
um, well, actually China later on. At that time, China was Taiwan. But um, uh, Soviet Union, France, believe it or not, and to some extent UK, who were opposed to any kind of charter review. But, um, you know, coming just, just coming back from um, uh, COP26, talking about and preaching <laughs> UN Charter Review as system change necessary to combat climate change. We were in the streets even on Saturday night in the streets of Glasgow, and we were saying, uh, what do we want? Climate democracy. When do we want it? Now. But usually they would say climate justice. And when do we want it now? So ours was a little bit different. We had a banner. People were behind us. What do you mean by climate democracy? And we were explaining, we mean people making decisions on climate change because it's all the states who are making the decision. And in fact, the concept of uh, system change, not climate change, uh, intrigued me when we were in a demonstration in Brussels, 30,000 people, and they were screaming system change, not climate change. But then I would ask what kind of system change they knew very well, what kind of system change they want domestically, like circular economy, carbon tax, what kind of legislation, what legal uh, cases, which were in Netherlands or Belgium, uh, related to climate change. But then I would ask them globally, even people from Amnesty International or some very well, you know, large NGOs, they were scratching their head, you know, what kind of, well, isn't the UN really, um, you know, the system or the global government or governance for climate? And we would say, no, General Assembly has no uh, legislative powers. There is no international court on the environment, they would say, well, what about the Hague, uh, you know, the Hague court? And we would say, well, you know, it's first of all on a voluntary basis, it doesn't have universal jurisdiction and it's really states, people uh, cannot bring any cases and it has to be uh, from states. So um, it all became very interesting, the topic of world federation, world government, as a solution to climate change. And um, I, uh, if you allow me, you good people and especially Bob, I'm gonna change this presentation because most of you know the subject and turn it into a workshop. This 50 minutes, we can have questions and answers. And uh, I like to learn as much from you as I'll be conveying information. So with that format, I'll just give, um, you know, like five minutes, uh, 10 minutes uh, maximum legislative history, and then we open it up to some real action and questions and maybe plan of actions. Is that okay, Bob? Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, right, so let's go to the legislative history. Let's go back to April, the last week of April, 1945. 50 states gather in San Francisco. And uh, actually, you know, there were a little bit less than 50, Argentina, Poland, few countries had problem getting credentials. There was a fight already between Soviet Union at the time, US that like Argentina, is it really, you know, pro-Nazi, pro-Germany or not? Or if Poland, is it the communist Poland, which is representing Poland? Or is it the, uh, you know, the, uh, the pro-West government of Poland? And um, the first week of the conference, Mussolini is hanged. And he, this is shown on UN TV in San Francisco. So every night people would go to all the delegates and watch the news on the cinema, UN cinema. And he was actually hung uh, upside down from the pictures that I've seen. Uh, second week into the conference, Hitler committed suicide. So this was very dramatic. The war in the Pacific was going on at full speed and uh, this was sort of uh, what people call the year zero of 1945, these events which were happening in 1945. So imagine in this kind of setting, 
Most of the countries who were there were freed by the Allied forces, UK, US, or Soviet Union as, you know, as part of, you know, in, under their domination. And you only had a few states which were independently minded. This was uh, the countries which were not touched by war. This was Australia, New Zealand, almost all of Europe was touched by war and some of the Latin American countries. They came, they sat on their desk, they all had a document called Dumbarton Oaks proposal. Most of them had not even seen Dumbarton Oaks proposal. This was um, just uh, between US, um, Russia, and UK, and to some extent, China, France didn't even know it's part of the Permanent Five until they came to San Francisco. So it really was the brainchild of Churchill, um, Stalin, and most importantly, Franklin Roosevelt. So they come here, they sit down, they see the Dumbarton Oaks proposal. They like a lot of things in there, but then they go to Security Council, they see there's definitely an apartheid system there are five permanent members who make laws for everybody because under chapter seven of the UN, you can make laws globally. You have world government, you have world law under chapter seven of the Security Council. But then the rest of the world cannot make laws for those five countries without their consent. So th immediately they found out this is not fair. Security Council, has defects. So they started making proposals and um, trying to change the charter, the Dumbarton Oaks and the Security Council. I won't go too much into history. They came up with 20 questions regarding Security Council and some other, you know, the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Uh, it was called the 20 questions. Um, it was Dr. Evans of Australia and Peter Fraser of uh, 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 New Zealand were sort of the champions of it. They brought it up to the permanent five, permanent five hung. They, you know, the system hung for three weeks. They went on their own way. <laughs> Nobody answered the 20, the 20 questions. They came back united that this is what you get. This is the charter you get. You have no choice or go home. In fact, that was a uh, Senator Colony of Texas who represented the Democratic Party, uh, the majority party at uh, San Francisco Convention. He ripped the charter and said, go home. You either sign or you go home. And of course they didn't want to go home. Some of them didn't even know how to go home because they were flown by US military planes or uh, by rail from New York. And, <laughs> They, they, you know, there was really a drama, you know, unlike what the most textbook tell you or history books, there was a big uh, opposition, which I call the San Francisco rebellion <laughs> regarding the, especially the Security Council. So there was a compromise. This compromise is Article 109 of the Charter. It was not in Dumbarton Oaks. Dumbarton Oaks had Article 108 or its equivalent, of course, the numbering changed which was the amendment process, but the charter review process wasn't there. So it was introduced, it was adopted unanimously to have a review conference. The opposition, which were actually the majority, about 12, 15 countries, uh, you know, quite a, they had a quite a op uh, opposition view to the Security Council, but, uh, a few other countries were switching, like Philippines, that, you know, the, at the beginning they were opposed, but there was some, uh, you might call soft coercion, you might call lobbying, they changed their position. But anyway, the majority, per our research, 33 countries of those 50 countries were against uh, some uh, uh, parts of uh, uh, the charter, specifically the Security Council. So, the opposing parties went and talked to the permanent five and said, okay, great, you gave us a chance. We are gonna have a review conference, but the provisions are a little bit tough. How about uh, making it easier for us? Let's have our uh, revision of the charter. These things are undemocratic. 
you know, the parts of the charter are, on the, are undemocratic. Human rights is not in there. International Court of Justice doesn't have universal jurisdiction. When are we going to get these? Then the promise was, and that's what we call the San Francisco promise, Article 109, Paragraph 3, which uh, Bob kindly read it for you. And in there it says, if there was no charter review, we are going to have it in 10 years' time. We are going to have it in 1955. We all realize the charter is incomplete. So they kind of put an expiration date on it. The expiration date was 1955. And as Bob also mentioned, that um, uh, proposal, it was put in the agenda of the Security Council and, uh, sorry, the General Assembly, and it was adopted by a big majority. And uh, the resolution which adopted it was 992X, and the X stands for the 10th year of uh, the UN uh, resolution numbering scheme. And then Security Council also voted to have it. With, um, there was uh, Russia opposed it and France abstained. And the other countries approved to have the uh, review conference. And mind you that if you read the article 109, a permanent five cannot veto holding the review conference. At a later stage, they can veto its ratification, but they cannot hold it from happening. So um, I think this is good enough uh, legislative history for our research. Um, the conference did not occur for 12 years. It was put in the agenda. A preparatory committee was supposed to be set up and it was set up, but every year they were uh, postponing to have the review conference because they were saying the time is not, um, the right time, it's the Cold War, we are not going to get anywhere, and that's how they convinced everybody else to postpone the conference. In 1967, the last resolution related to this uh, review conference says we are going to keep the conference in being, the word being, but didn't set any date for when it can reconvene. Now, per our legal research, we can have it tomorrow. We can have the review conference tomorrow. Nothing is going to hold us from having it. This is in terms of legally, the internal legal um, uh, procedures at the UN. Of course, the politics of it is a lot, lot more different. Now, before we sort of make it a workshop and get your inputs on this, uh, I want to mention two important things. Uh, the Article 109. <clears throat> First of all, the fact that paragraph three, already we have the charter review. We don't need two thirds majority to hold it. It's already done. It's resolution 992X and the corresponding resolution from the Security Council. Now, the question becomes that uh, can a permanent five veto immediately? And the answer is no. The conference, the way it's read, it's very open. It doesn't have its own rules of procedures or it can have its own rules of procedures. It's not under New York. It doesn't have to be in New York and it's not reporting to General Assembly. So it's separate from General Assembly. It's like a constitutional convention for the UN. It's a new San Francisco conference and it was intended that way. Um, now, the, for whatever they decide on, and we can get to that, you know, what the possible scenarios are, but whatever they decide on, it requires two thirds uh, approval of the member states. But if they get the two thirds approval, even if, for example, Russia, US or China veto it, it won't stop it. It goes to their national capitals. And I think this is very significant for us to know because as soon as it leaves New York, the whole um, discourse changes, the whole situation changes. It's us, the people, the civil society, the parliaments, the Congress, the Senate, we all get involved. You know, this is when there could be pressure on the administration of the time, whoever said no, to put pressure or global uh, uh, population to put uh, pressure 
on approving the two-thirds majority of the world's wishes. Now, uh, for example, the global challenges like climate change, um, I'll, I'll just finish by saying my, uh, you know, two, one minute observation of the uh, COP26. Uh, we have had 26 COPs. For 26 years, we haven't been able to resolve climate change. And every year it's gotten worse. Then we have Kyoto Protocol. Then we have Paris Accords. They are actually a little bit different than COP26 or whatever COP decides. Then we have G5 and G20. G20 just met before COP26, and they supposedly make decisions on climate. And these, these all have failed. And for the audience and the people who would listen to us, not that we had the forum, not that we had really a big speech there, but we, the country delegates that we would talk to, with the NGOs that we talked to, we said, okay, you guys want system change? If you want the system change, UN has to change. If you want an easy way for the UN to change, hold the review conference, focus on solving the global um, you know, problem of uh, climate change. And uh, we had a lot of sympathy, both from NGOs. We spoke with uh, several country delegates, um, for example, and we had some kind of relationship with them in terms of some of what our youth climate ambassadors do or they were from. We, we talked to the country delegates from Cameroon, from uh, Gambia, uh, Island of Tuvalu, uh, Fiji. We talked to Israel. We talked to a uh, couple of other countries. We got their views. Most of them were favorable, not all of them to like a charter review. But uh, I, will, I will end here. And in terms of the workshop, uh, since we are not at Center for UN Constitutional Research, we are not proposing any solution. We are proposing this process solution, the solution of, um, you know, how, we, how through a process we can get to solutions. And it's a plural solutions, meaning it could be many different things, like focus on climate change, it could be um, you know, focus on nuclear disarmament. It could be a parliament. And actually, you know, in our Epirus declaration, the youth climate ambassadors, there is four important elements that uh, we all agreed on. Uh, this was in Brussels and Greece and about 70 uh, folks, which 53 of them were from uh, different parts of the world and they were all under 35 years. And the principles that we are declaring there in climate democracy is a UN parliament. Now, a UN parliament with decision-making or representation as part of the UN constitution. A UN court for the environment, which means that um, it would have universal, universal uh, jurisdiction, uh, recognizing the right to a clean environment as an environmental right. Because if you look at the very fantastic uh, human rights documents we have, including Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there is no mention of the environment. Or if you look at the two covenants, the civil and political uh, covenants on uh, human rights, no mention of the environment. So we need to incorporate the human rights into the UN Charter. And uh, how do we get there? Our proposal is through the Charter Review. Um, we are about halfway through the 50 minute time okay. now, just to okay. let you know. Sorry, I was gonna talk uh, not much and let, let it be a workshop. So my recommendation now is that um, we go to the other presenters, my colleagues, my friends, and ask them, if a review conference is held, uh, would it help or would it hurt their, their cause? Because again, we are not uh, proposing any solution, we are uh, proposing the process. So we can ask uh, Andreas that UNPA with a charter review help or hurt in their opinion. We can ask um, Uniting for Democracies uh, that uh, if it helps them or hurts them. Uh, creating a world constitution, 
if you have a charter review, would it help or hurt them? And uh, the regional integrations as well. So, so, I, so let, let me, Shariar, let, let me jump in just to ask one or two logistical things. First, I want to invite anybody who wants to respond to go off mute. So we're, we're breaking, breaking set here. So you can go off mute uh, and raise your cyber hand. That would be preferable. So it'll put you in line um, in the order that you raise your hand. And, um, and Sharia, do you want to call on people or do you want us to call on people? No, i rather if you do the moderation, actually. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. I also want to not put anyone specific on the spot. Um, so if you feel, if you're, feel inclined to respond, please do. If you feel inclined to not respond, please don't. So um, just to leave it open in that way. So floor is open. You've heard most of the other presenters. You may be aligned with one uh, path or another already. You may be open-minded. You may be more integrative about them all. But if you have a response to Shariar's question, just raise your hand. Um, if you're not raising your cyber hand, just wave so I can see you and I'll put you in the queue. Could we have a time limit on it? Yes, we have a time limit. Um, with this session ends. Um, at, at what, uh, uh, 10 minutes before 10 the minutes hour. 10 minutes to the hour, yeah. Well, I meant like one, one, 60 seconds or 90 seconds. For oh, to add, for the response. Yeah, yes, thank you. We'll ask people to be brief so, <laughs> so a number of people can get in. At the moment though, I'm not seeing any responses. People are either baffled by the question no andreas or, andreas and tad have their hands oh, up i see i didn't see the hands okay thank you so let's do it andreas and then tad and then simon and then we'll take another show of hands thank you sherry for this nice presentation and i have 90 seconds i understand mm -hmm. so i won't say much it's also partly um subject of the presentation later on um, but um, since you called on me directly, I wanted to say this. Um, does it hurt or benefit um, the project of the UN Parliamentary Assembly? My short response is, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. It depends on um, whether there is a political window of opportunity at the time of such a charter review conference and the subsequent ratification process to achieve the UN Parliament you spoke about. That is, that is the key, the crucial question. And Sharia, you, you rightfully pointed out that there is this crucial difference between the legal process and the political process. And that's um, the nexus um, we are in the middle in. Great. Thank you, Andreas. We have Ted up next, followed by Simon. And again, raise your hand and I'll put you in the queue if you want to go after that. Go ahead, Ted. Sure, Yar, thank you so much for just terrific, uh, both historical research. You must know more about the history of this provision in the charter, how it came about and evolved than virtually anyone in the world. Um, and, 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 and we need to get that history out there so people can think about how to apply it to the future. Thank you too for the shout out uh, to me, as you know, um, yeah, I guess it was 25, 26 years ago. Uh, a couple of uh, full of themselves college students, Rick Ponzio and Tad Daly. Uh, he was finishing his undergrad and I was finishing his PhD during the 50th anniversary year in 1995. So we had a thing called the Campaign for a New UN Charter. But much like your work, Sharyar, we didn't have a Daly and Ponzio Charter all written out and say, please adopt this new UN Charter. Instead, our call to action was to activate Article 109 so that people in a wide variety of different issue areas, human rights and climate and war and peace could all come together and say, we can focus on having some kind of process to redesign the United Nations as we put it then for the problems of the 21st century, not the problems of uh, 1945. Um, I guess if I have a very specific question I wanna ask you, you know, I know more than, about Article 109 than most, and, and yet even I, am even I am unclear about this. Is it your contention that if someone in the GA was to propose an Article 109 conference uh, next week, that the rule then would be the Article 109.3 rule, 
that it wouldn't require two thirds of the GA and any nine of the 15 Security Council members in order to convene, but it would be that lesser threshold uh, that's laid out in Article 109.3. I hope that was a clear question. Great. Uh, so I, I must jump in as facilitated just to ask Shariar, are you also open to questions or do you just want responses now to your question and then you take the other questions after? What do you want? Uh, up, up to you. I can either answer one at a time or- it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's fine on. with me. It, it, I have no preference. I want to make this work for you. So do okay. you- I, I think we can entertain more questions if I leave my responses to the end. Okay. Uh, gonna, yeah. So, so I'm sorry, do you want me to hold the questions to the end and just take the responses to your questions first? Oh, uh, it's getting confusing. Let yes. me respond. <laughs> Let okay. me respond right now, but I'll try to make it short so other questions can be entertained. Um, well, uh, Tad, that's a good question. Uh, legally, technically, there is no reason to do another voting to have the uh, you know, the charter review be adopted, which is difficult, then it puts it back in the two thirds. And uh, two thirds in this day and age may not be easy to get. Whereas the whole promise in San Francisco was that it's not two thirds, it's understood, we are going to have it. In fact, if you read Article 109, it says majority, that's uh, 109.3. The, it says the majority, it doesn't say two thirds. Whereas in uh, article, you know, the paragraph one, it says two thirds. So why should we go back? You know, it was, it's our right to have the charter review and it was adopted. We shouldn't, you know, give up on that. That said, goes back to the political thing, you know, Andrea's uh, mentioned. Politically, I think they're gonna kill us. If we bring this up, just one nation, you're going to bring all kinds of excuses, all kinds of, you know, and the permanent five have done this for 76 years. They, they say, okay, let's have a committee to evaluate this. And then that committee gets derailed. And for, you know, <laughs> for, you know, years, we are going to be seeing, should we have a, you know, the, should we have a review conference based on paragraph three or based on paragraph one? So that's why I think we really need the alliance. We need champion states. We need more than just one country bringing it up. So, you know, the maybe minimum of 20 countries, making sure every continent is represented and making sure both global north and global south are represented. So the permanent five won't find excuses and derail us. So to, the, to answer, I think legally, procedurally, we don't need the two thirds vote, but politically, uh, if we do it just with one or two nations asking for it, I don't think we will get anywhere. Hey, thank you, Shariar. Just so that I, I'm clear on how I'm facilitating, I will then proceed by allowing both questions to you and responses to your question. Is that, is that okay with you? Yeah, that's fine with me, yes. Okay, great. So now the, the floor is now open for both responses to, oh, and, and, and Simon, you're up next. I just wanna let everyone know the floor is now open to both questions for Shariar as well as responses to his question. So Simon, you're up next, thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Shariar. We all know that the, uh, in the UN, the uh, Security Council is an autocracy uh, whereas the rest of us are hoping to be or practice democracy. And as you pointed out, that's the issue. How can we somehow uh, bring this autocracy to democracy? That's the, really the main question that I have. Somehow, you know, these five permanent members, you know, behave like a democratic country. That was 75 years ago when there were a lot of, you know, wars and things, and they have to now comply with the rest of the world somehow or other. How can the majority of us do this for the five? Okay, uh, thank you, Simon. Sure you are. Well, <clears throat> of course, the world has changed a lot uh, since 1945. Um, a few of those permanent five don't really have that. They are not the big powers they used to be. 
obviously Japan, Germany, Brazil, uh, you know, are going to have large voices. They're going to, India, very, very important. So if the charter review is held, we are not going to have the Security Council, which we have now. Obviously, it's going to change. And that's why I think, that's why the Permanent Five is so opposed to any even discussion on charter review. And they very cleverly derailed the question in 1960s. Great, thank you. Um, I see Andreas's hand up next. Take it away, Andreas. Yes, I happen to have a question too, uh -huh. which is um, related to um, Sharia, what you said about um, the review conference being separate from the UN or the GA. Um, and perhaps you can elaborate uh, more on that. As far as I would understand, um, it would be under the purview of the UN, maybe not um, with the rules of procedure of the GA, obviously, but nonetheless, um, the process uh, practically um, would be organized by the Secretariat, I, I would assume. So that's that's where my question is coming from. Right. Um, the ch uh, the ch well, Article 109 is not clear about it. Uh, you know, if if it was going to be a part of the General Assembly decision or control or financing or whatever, it would have uh, been like the previous, you know, it would have been a General Assembly decision. This is not a General Assembly decision. And this is once the decision is made, it goes out of the UN. This becomes similar to some conferences that we've had in the past. For example, the uh, WTO was preceded with the UN trade agreement. I'm not sure exactly what was the name of it, but that was part of the UN. Then they decided to, they decided to have a convention of the state parties to decide the fate of um, uh, you know, that economic agreement under the UN. The state parties all of a sudden decided they don't want to have anything to do with the UN. And it was the state parties that got together. Same thing as International Criminal Court. International Criminal Court was a resolution to be held by General Assembly to have, uh, you know, uh, it recommended to have the International Criminal Court, but actually the Rome Convention was totally separate. It's the same as Paris Accords or COP Convention. The convention we are just coming from, UNFCCC is the facilitator, but it has no role in terms of dictating anything, financing anything, or you know, uh, doing uh, like for example, uh, having a, a sanctions of the, the UN can have under its own charter and security council. In other words, to make it simpler, to say it simpler, my interpretation, and by the way, I studied this, there is, since you know, it's been neglected, there is no legal interpretation of the how the conference would be held. It all goes back to 1940s and 50s. Those legal interpretations were that this conference is gonna be independent. This conference is gonna have its own rules of procedures and each state is gonna send its own representatives. So if their representative, they wanna send their general assembly representative, they can. But if they wanna send somebody new, they can. And there is no limit how long it's gonna take. It might take six months, nine months, a year or two years to convene the conference and get it to uh, adopt something. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Donna Park. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shariar, for being with us today. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us um, a brief overview of what you think uh, both the benefits of having a charter review might be and what the risks are of doing it. Well, the benefits, I think, is the fact that everything would be on the table. All the problems, all the global problems, you know, the extreme poverty, nuclear disarmament, war and peace, uh, human rights, and of course, climate change. Everything would be on the table. Um, and that's exactly, you know, if you look at the article, it says a general conference. It doesn't say a specific conference. 
that is going to be held. It would be like a constitutional convention. What I think would happen is that there would be not, you know, a big transformation right away, that there would be certain hot topics which would be discussed, for example, climate change. And at least in climate change, there would be some decisions. For example, uh, that, uh, you know, we might have a, a parliament for climate change, not a you know, general parliament uh, of the UN, that we might have a creation of an international court on the environment, uh, which of course could be the jurisdiction could be given to ICJ or it could be a separate court. Uh, there, uh, so I would see uh, small changes or adoption of a UNPA under General Assembly, not you know having full powers. Uh, so I think these are the benefits. The benefits is that everything is on the table. The high, the spotlight is on the convention. It's not the news media, the people. Uh, everybody would be involved. This is going to be like a COP26. COP26 has been getting so much publicity. 50,000 people participated. You know, thousands of NGO representatives pa participated. All the news media attention was there. I think a UN Charter Review, a new global governance would get the same type of attention. So that's, I think, the best thing we can do. In terms of the risks, people tell me, you know, sometimes they're quiet about it. Like, you know, I had opposition from World Federalist Movement when I first uh, uh, presented the idea in um, Argentina at the uh, Congress there. And then again in Winnipeg. In Argentina, very few countries or, you know, representatives supported me. In Winnipeg, it was about like 40%. And uh, actually, Bob was one of the supporters there, <laughs> uh, and Joe Schwartzberg, actually. <clears throat> um, but uh, the leadership then, uh, the leadership then thought it would cause, just like the Soviet argument in 1950s, who opposed the Charter Review, that the Charter would be ripped, that the smaller countries are going to take over, we're going to lose, uh, like, uh, human rights, uh, uh, things that we have achieved in the UN or the International Criminal Court, but I'm not going to go to that argument because those are false, false argument because none of the UN human rights conventions are in the charter, so they don't have that kind of constitutional value, and ICC is not part of the UN. So, uh, yeah, so the risk that some people talk about that the uh, UN would fall apart. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Gail Hughes. Um, I was struck by that there was a change in the Security Council from China being represented by Taiwan to China being represented by you know, the, the, main, the mainland. And I'm wondering, I mean, so it, there have been change, or at least there was a change. How did that happen? It seems to me encouraging. Can we learn something about, you know, from that as to how other changes could be made? Yeah, very good question. Uh, there has been, uh, well, I want to say three uh, changes to the charter in the past uh, history, uh, but actually it was really. Uh, uh, four, but the, I don't. I won't get into. Uh, and one, the fourth one was kind of related to one or not. But I don't want to confuse you. Uh, very good question. Actually, twice uh, we've had uh, the ECOSOX, the number of membership increased, and one time the Security Council membership increased from eleven to fifteen, and uh, that situation. Uh, Soviet Union was against, France was against, so they you know, voted no. Uh, and um, uh, UK and US surprisingly abstained. And China was the only one who voted yes. But then again, because the ratification process is similar to charter review, for two years, there was public pressure 
from the uh, public international governments to change their mind. So at the end of the two, second year, all five countries, even though they could have vetoed the ratification and freeze the charter, they decided not to do so. And I hope this would happen in any charter review convention. Great. And by the way, this was all until 19, late 1960s. So in the past uh, 50 years, we haven't had, uh, 60 years actually, we haven't had any kind of charter change. So Sharyar, just to let you know, we've run out of time for questions or comments. I'll allow people or invite people to remute themselves if you're not already on mute. So any last words that you'd like to leave us with before we go on break? If you want system change, do it the official, what was prescribed in the charter. Let's do it through Article 109. That's the only legal process we have to introducing global governance change. Great. Well, I want to thank you, Sharia, for joining us and racing back from COP to get online and, and give us all this information. And uh, we'll be in touch later. And I invite everybody now to take a break. We'll start 